The comments, opinions, and views shared during this program are of those individual Freemasons and do not reflect the official position of a Grand Lodge, Concordant Body, Appendant Body, Masonic Authority, or CraftsmanOnline.com. Welcome to the Craftsman Online Podcast, the only five-star rated Masonic podcast endorsed by the Grand Lodge of New York. This episode of the Craftsman Online Podcast is sponsored by Bricks Masons. From elegant Masonic rings that showcase your commitment to our craft, to finely crafted regalia and apparel that honor your tradition, Bricks Masons delivers quality and craftsmanship that truly stands out. Shop now at BricksMasons.com and use promo code CRAFTSMAN to receive free shipping with your first order. Hello again, it's Brother Michael Arce, co-founder of CraftsmanOnline.com. You've joined us for an episode on the history of collars, and I realize for most men, a collared shirt is part of an outfit that is used when we wear a necktie or have the need to dress up, maybe for an event or a lodge event. And while that may be partially true, the shirt collar has a much deeper and kind of a surprising meaning. And that's why we brought in uh, Brother Kevin Schamberger, who's going to be taking us through the history of collars from polo shirts to neck armors. Welcome to the Craftsman Online podcast, my brother. Thank you very much, brother. It's an honor to be here. I'm so excited to have you on here because Kevin is a fellow D.C. brother. I never know how to pronounce the name of your lodge correctly now here in D.C. Uh, Lycienne. It's basically French for Haitian and the, you know, the French la in front of it. It's kind of conjugated instead of la or la. It's L apostrophe H and kind of the H is silent. So it's Lycienne. I see. It's one of the things I love about the D.C. Grand Lodge is we have a very metro flavor with a lot of international lodges present. And Brother Kevin Schamberger is here to join us. So this is the first episode that we've ever done on the Craftsman Online podcast that deals with clothing. And what's funny is that the shirt collar is something that modern men, a lot of times today, just looking at the both of us on camera here, we're kind of avoiding this. We prefer to wear T-shirts, a little bit more of a casual look over a collared shirt. So I have to ask her this really simple question. What was your inspiration for researching the history of shirt collars? Well, Brother Michael, I was fascinated <clears throat> by their inclusion on shirts being a staple of higher class culture. Uh, polo is referred to as the sport of kings and is generally played by high, high society. But it never made sense to me that a polo shirt constituted the base level of professional workwear or better known as business casual. I mean, we're going to work and we're wearing these collared shirts that were played basically for these, these tennis players and polo players. And then meanwhile, in business formal, uh, there's like see, these tiers and everything had a collar, whether it's with a tie or with a jacket. And you even have the lapel, which we can get into later. Uh, but as Freemasons, we wear livery collars. And I was thinking about how that's like three collars, you know, and then we wear a tuxedo or a black suit. So the neck is also an erogenous zone in a popular culture, the target of a vampire's desire. And it got me thinking, since the word neck is tied to nectar and necro, I knew there was something more that needed to be investigated. Okay, I dig this. Yeah. And for some time, I lived a number of years in Troy, New York, which is the birthplace of Uncle Sam. They're very proud of that. But it's also known as the Collar City because during the 18, 1900s, a lot of manufactured collars, the dress shirt of the time would be what we know as like the button down shirt with the long sleeves, but there would be no neck collar. It was kind of a Mandarin style shirt and you would buy temporary collars or, or quote unquote fake collars that you would button into your shirt so that you could easily just throw it away at the end of the day and continue to like reuse that shirt. So to hear that you would put a lodge presentation together to get into the history of collars, I was like, oh, we, we got to have them on the podcast. And the fact that collars have had a lot of different names over the years is something that's really interesting in your presentation. You talk about, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but gorgets, is that the right way to say that? I believe so. All right. And known as the rough, which is the shirt collar that we know today. So what was the function of these things? Or did they have a, a practical use besides just kind of looking elegant or formal around our neck? Yeah, it, it looks like they've definitely had different variations and different functions. And they've kind of morphed over time. Uh, it did start, I think, with the gorgets as far as in Western culture, which was basically neck armor that was popular when chainmail was in vogue. 
Uh, once plate armor came into fashion, gorgets were more of an ornamental thing. Uh, you may have seen military officers have kind of like a silver crescent-shaped necklace. That's what we know as a gorget today. However, collars were already worn ornamentally by a variety of ancient cultures around the world. For example, there was a gold decorative high-ranking warrior collar in Ireland during the Bronze Age called the Glynan Sheen gorget that looks conspicuously like a collar Egyptian pharaohs wore. I don't know if that's a connection between Egypt and Ireland, as people have uh, looked into. Hmm. And what I was looking at through the progression, and you, you have a great presentation in your slides where you show what some of us would recognize as like the first formal collar, which uh, if you've looked at the liquor bottle for beef eaters, <laughs> um, it's that like fancy Swiss guard, you know, puffy style collar that goes around the neck. It almost looks like a, a lion's mane. Yeah, the rough, uh, definitely, uh, that was one of the popular collars. They had a, a couple different types, but that one was definitely popularized because like you were saying about detachable collars it was one of the detachable collars that you could basically take off and launder it separately so that you didn't get your shirt dirty okay and the more ornate the collar the more decorated the more color uh i think at some point they even started like weaving in gold or silver threads to really give it a design that was kind of like the first um symbolism for your place and like society or culture that's right uh, it was in the 15th century that introduced livery collars, and that's where you would see a lot of the the jewelry and ornaments kind of uh, put into the collar, uh, where, you know, as masons, we have like these velvet with metal kind of linking plates on it. And it was what powerful symbols of royal power, uh, tying those who wore them to the king, and it denoted service to a lord. And it was during that time when rough collars were introduced in a separate way. They were they were really more popular in the 16th and 17th century during Queen Elizabeth's reign and the Renaissance. So the livery collars were kind of a separate collar for the purpose that I stated. Now, you might remember seeing Shakespeare wearing a rough collar, and that's with the circular lace iteration, like you said, off the beef eaters bottle. It's basically a symbol of aristocracy. So you have, you know, the, the people that are serving the royalty wearing these livery collars, and then you have aristocracy they're actually wearing. Uh, the rough collars, unless you see them in their official portrait, you might see some pictures where they're wearing the, the livery collar. But eventually, uh, these kind of shifted around to like some of the, the removable collars, like you mentioned, and uh, it became more of a fashion context and, and got away from the functional aspects. So folks in the Northeast will understand the historical relevance of layers of clothing, where today, we don't really get it. It just looks like something that quote unquote completes a look. So you have a collared shirt that represents professional or formal attire, but you had kind of mentioned that a man back in the day would also have a jacket that would have lapels. When, what, what did the jacket lapels originally mean and, and how do they connect with the history of the collar? Yeah, actually a lapel does mean collar. If you dig back far enough, you can see it connected because it basically gives that jacket its formality. Basically, formality has come to mean dress code for functions such as work. And so we, like you said, we wear it with a suit. You could have a black tie. And yes, while we're wearing the tie down the middle with the button up, it's the collar that gives the class to the shirt. And so the lapel basically serves as a second collar. And I believe the reason of this is because the heads of state would wear them. And if you get into the word capital, it actually comes from the word kaput, which means head. And you can see this in the word, whether you're talking about DC's Capitol Hill or Italy's Capitoline Hill, where Capitol Hill is from. Also, the collar accentuates the neck, much like a necklace. And if you notice the two words, neck and lace, well, what is the rough collar? It's lace, right? And then we have women that are gorgeous, which is from the root word of gorge, which is where gorge it comes from. And that's from the word throat. And then collars stem from the root word for neck, which is column. And you can kind of be reminiscent of column with an N, and we'll get into that a little bit later. It kind of will allude to some of the things that I think more of the learned listeners would know as far as we get into some of the signs and the penalties and some of the Masonic secrets that are associated with the degrees. And now the collar is going to going to really start to make sense as the neck is like a, a vital organ, so to speak. But it's interesting when you were talking about the first lapels, I mean, now we look at a, a modern suit that you would buy off the rack and there's that, that little slot for the lapel pin and people will put flowers or pins in there. 
But back in the day, on the opposite side of the jacket, there used to be a button, and you could close that. It was functional, where today it's a little bit more decorative. And uh, I actually misspoke. It's the, the definition of lapel is continuation of a collar. Yeah, and it served that function of like really protecting your vitals and staying warm during cold winters. Like you think of George Washington and the times that were happening during the Revolutionary War and the famous pictures of him crossing the Delaware River with his you know jacket closed, which nowadays you wouldn't see because they don't operate that way. Exactly. And, and that's kind of what's ironic with T-shirts, how they become this fashion staple. But they originally started as undershirts, like in the Navy, when they would get hot in the submarine, they would take off their top garment and the T-shirt underneath, it would be to soak up sweat, which was a lot of sports people also started using it, like in football jerseys. But because of these rebel icons like James Dean and Marlon Brando were wearing them around, or you might remember Fonzie from Happy Days, they became a trend. And next thing you know, it went from Fruit of the Loom using these undergarments as just to go with your underwear to become a fashion statement. And that's where we actually got the line of clothing called streetwear, where they where they popularized work boots, sweatpants, jerseys, and that's also sportswear that it's kind of a crossover. But you see, these are new trends of fashion that was originally not the fashion because most people there was a time uh where everybody was wearing suits and now you see we're wearing everything yeah no it's interesting you you mentioned that i was thinking of elvis and the movie that came out recently with him and they talk about the the jumpsuit that he wore and the style of collar and he was a big fan of napoleon or actually not he but the designer was a fan of napoleon and said hey napoleon used to have these like longer collars like which now have become the but the butterfly collars that were very popular in the 70s but elvis was really kind of the trendsetter for that it was really to distinguish him and make him seem more manly because he had a bigger neck and was a stronger person i'm sitting here going i can't believe we're talking about collars but it is so interesting especially in freemasonry when you get to a lodge and you see the officers at their certain stations have collars, and this is where we get the dual meaning in Freemasonry because, as you mentioned, we that kind of associates with the ornate neckwear that lodge officers will wear that often hold a jewel that represents that mason's office in the lodge. So where did the history of these things come from? Well, so basically Masonic collars are livery collars, and that by extension relates to knighthood because the chivalric orders would also wear these livery collars. And you can associate most of the decorative metals and, and collars to those. Uh, it originated with French noble Philip III, who was the Duke of Burgundy, and he gave his knights of the Golden Fleece collars. And then also uh, this extended down the line of French kings to their knights. And even Napoleon had bestowed a collar to his highest ranking knight. So the word livery has to do with the specific dress to denote the status of belonging to a trade. And these trade associations were originally church-related fraternal organizations that became medieval guilds and then corporations by royal charter. So such a trade in London would be referred to as, and this might sound familiar to all the Masons out there, worshipful company of said trade or craft. Hmm. Okay. And then my thought is, you know, going further back in time, a lot of times we try to associate the degrees with Freemasonry or some of the enlightenment or the pursuit of light that comes with Freemasonry to what the ancient Egyptians were doing. Did you see any connection between our history of collars, the jewels that we wear with what the ancient Egyptians wore? Uh, yeah. So, well, I think there's, it's kind of debatable. Well, I guess what the different connections could be and different myths. But when it comes to Egyptian, there definitely seems to be something. For example, in R.A. Schwaller de Lubis's Magna, Magna Opus, The Temple of Man, he says that the, the aprons proportionally display the geometric construction of the panels and walls of the rooms of the pyramids that they were displayed in. And it shows, higher, you know, not hieroglyphs, but yeah, I guess basically hieroglyphs of these people in aprons. And they look different than Masonic aprons. That's that's one link. Another is uh, jewelry back in these ancient times were a highly effective way for individuals to link themselves to the divine through their form or material or symbols and ornaments. So the identity of these personages who don them could change, and that would allow someone to invoke or stand in for, represent, or connect with or merge with a deity or even assume a state of divinity. So you can see this in the mask of King Tutankhamun, which is featured on the Usek collar 
which looks a lot like that Irish Glen and Sheen Gorgata I mentioned earlier. But basically, if you look at a bust, you can see it around the neck of King Tut. In Egypt time, you would see the pharaohs and their family members and high priests wearing the collars, but not common people like today would be wearing T-shirts because that would separate them as a band of workmen. And the pharaohs would have the collars, which would distinguish them as a band of royalty or some significance. Exactly. It's just like uh, when the polo shirts were made for the sport. They originally didn't have collars, but it was just to protect them from like the, the elements and the wind and everything. But later on, it was through uh, Lacoste, the tennis player, that he actually popularized the polo shirt that we know today. You could kind of see over time how this kind of evolved, but yet this is still the basis of the lowest form of formality of what we wear at work, business casual. It has nothing to do with sport today, other than the fact the most popular brand has a polo player on it, right? So, or it has an alligator. But when it comes to collars of what royalty would wear, like in Egypt, uh, other than what these livery collars that royals and masons wear, I haven't really seen too many connections. Hello, it's Brother Michael R.C. for Bricks Masons. The Craftsman Online podcast is now sponsored by Bricks Masons. BricksMasons.com is my favorite destination for all my Masonic shopping needs, whether it's apparel for myself or a pretty cool gift idea for a brother. You can make BrickMasons.com your online marketplace where tradition meets innovation. So we're talking about collars specifically on this episode. And guess what's at BricksMasons.com? Masonic collars. And they have them for just about every kind of Masonic body. But let's stay blue lodge centric let's say your lodge is looking to get new collars to start the year well they've got a couple different varieties here one is a blue velvet it's a dark blue velvet master mason blue collar that you can just attach the jewels from your lodge to if you want to go that route or you can get a different look in royal blue that does have each of the individual officers emblems on the collar which you can still also attach the traditional ornamental jewel to the collar. Visit BricksMasons.com and explore their extensive catalog and elevate your Masonic experience with style and substance. Plus, our podcast listeners can use promo code CRAFTSMAN at checkout and enjoy free shipping with your first order. There's one brother that you and I like to point to because he's one of the biggest believers and advocates for our mystery schools, and that's Manly P. Hall who stated that, quote, the human body is divided into three major parts. So I know you're a scholar of Manly P. Hall, Kevin. What are those parts? What do they represent? And how are they connected to collars? Well, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that neck in Latin is column, C-O-L-L-U-M. And the top vertebrae is called the atlas bone because it gives support to the weight of the skull, much like Atlas, who is basically said to be holding up the heavens. So the skull and its contents is related to heaven, basically metaphorically. And the spinal column is earth. And the basis of the spine is hell. Uh, So there's a lot to get into here. Many religious and philosophical allegories utilize these three anatomical structures. One I will mention is Plato's tripartite soul, which relates to the three parts of the body, which is the head, the chest, and the stomach. And according to his work, the Timaeus, in the creation story of man, the mortal soul is placed in the chest, but the spirited part of the soul is placed in the neck so as not to allow the mortal soul to contaminate the, the immortal soul. I'm just going to throw this in here. This has been supposedly disproven, but you might remember in Pulp Fiction where Marcellus had a Band-Aid on the back of his neck after he opened up that uh, briefcase that had a, a shining light out of it, which was supposedly his soul. What they say is he actually you know, had some razor burn type stuff on the back of his neck. And that's why that bandaid is there. But there's a theory that he sold his soul to get that, that briefcase. So hmm. if you contrast this with how the Egyptians would place a golden collar on the neck of the deceased on the day of their funeral in the book of the dead, this was to protect them in the afterlife. And so some collars were buried with mummies, uh, and would have amulets to protect them. And this is where, for those that are in the know, like being, a basically executed by having your throat cut open and just being drained of all your blood from your neck from from artery to artery which they probably didn't have a really firm understanding of that time but that was one of the most disgraceful yet painful ways to be killed yes and that's why i think uh 
if you get into the vampire myth where they're basically sucking the blood out of the neck uh it's it's nectar in a way to this vampire you could kind of say as a god uh because he's everlasting he lives forever meanwhile the greek gods would drink ambrosia which is nectar and nectar and neck also ties in with the word necro for death and then there's necromancy which involves this dark practice that involves basically making zombies you know reanimating the dead to live you know to live through this animated spirit so there's definitely something with the neck that goes much deeper than a lot of what we've been told right yeah and i'm also going to thinking of like when the pharaohs would be buried they would have a lot of their vital organs taken from them and the brain and the heart were some of the early ones that they wanted to have uh, buried next to them in like the the gold pots or in the the special uh, containers for lack of a better term yeah and it, it just makes me think that they must have understood that the blood that flew from the heart up to the brain and then came back to the body and nourish it had some sort of special power oh yeah for sure i mean you know they have a whole uh symbolic within their hieroglyphics they have uh one of the concepts is a pillar called the jed pillar and it's symbolic of the backbone uh more specifically representing osiris's backbone who in the masonic myth uh i don't know how much i can say here but in the master mason degree osiris is there represented at the end uh th that's something to think about but basically there's several book of the dead spells that are representations of the jed pillar symbol and they're used to help reinstate the vertebrae of the deceased and consequently revive them for his or her rebirth into the afterlife. If you remember, uh, they couldn't find, I think it was Osiris's backbone. Uh, and with Nimrod, the same myth was with his penis, right? And and then they found it. Basically, when you wear the jet pillar as an amulet, the symbol would help invoke the regenerative powers of Osiris. And Albert Mack actually referenced this in his The Symbolism of Freemasonry, when he wrote, Osiris, the chief god of the ancient Egyptians, and worshipped as a symbol of the sun, and more philosophically, as the male or generative principle. And one last thing to touch on is a fun fact, is that the Jed Pillar is also the inspiration behind George Lucas's Jedi. Hmm, okay. Well, I was just thinking, you've mentioned the word male a lot, and just looking at still how the article of clothing is worn. Like, yes, women now have shirts with collars that button up, but... In traditional times, theirs was more flat and lacy and kind of ornate and closer to their body where the men was like protecting that vital organ and, and keeping them safe. Do you find any significance with the fact that Osiris is kind of being the original, you know, sun god worship model is always projected as a male? And yet as men, we tend to continue to wear clothing that protects that neck? I guess what you're referring to is... Um about the kundalini so the kundalini is the spiritual force uh the spiritual life force the creative force the generative force that's within our the base of our spine kind of coiled up like a snake you might see some symbolism that shows to that and basically as it rises up through the spine through the nerve nerve centers of the spine and once it gets to the neck it it activates or it gets actually into the brain stem into the brain and it can bring enlightenment here's what's interesting and, and i know you personally one of my favorite brothers here in the washington dc area when i talk about a learned scholar i mean kevin is somebody that is into studying everything from the rosicrucians to modern magic to the histories of the ancients and here we are having a conversation about callers when you started this presentation, did you like scratch your head and you're like, why, why am I starting with this? Why, why am I going to be talking to my lodge about shirt collars? So I originally was, I originally, my number one focus was, I thought there was something to there being three collars. I thought you have the, first, I didn't understand how these sports shirts of these elite classes ended up being the very bare minimum of what we can wear to work. I mean, you can't wear a t-shirt to work. You can't wear a collar shirt. You have to at least wear a quote unquote polo shirt to work, right? But then as Masons, we wear these, these suits, these tuxedos that have a second collar, which is the lapel. And then on top of that, we wear this third collar, which is the livery collar. 
And in fact, I didn't mention this, but there's a there is a collar that the Pope wears only during a specific mass uh, ritual. So I was seeing collars as I studied them as literally the mark of the highest, uh, basically, ritual wear that existed. And it's through all the cultures. So that I knew there was something. And then also I was looking into the fact that like our body is separated in three. So we have our head and neck. That's Then we have the torso and then we have the, the legs, right? So we have the neck that separates. I mean, we have the, the necklace and then we have a belt. And it made me think of the beltway that goes around, you know, the city. And a belt is like a like a zoning. So we are, our body is in three, in three. And, and and that ties into the spirit, soul, and body. And everything's in three. So collars had a much deeper meaning. Uh, I knew there was something there, but I, I didn't know what it was, and I wanted to find it. Yeah, and without giving any of the secrets away of our degrees, I just jotted down a note, the cable toe. Like, the cable toe and the placement of the cable toe, especially in that entered apprentice degree now, has such a deeper meaning to me because so many guys will ask, like, why do I have to wear this thing around my neck? Like, what is the significance of this? And we say, oh, well, it's because if for some reason this doesn't work out, we can just kind of lead you out of the lodge. But in a way, that would also be like a workman's way to protect their neck or secure their neck going through a rite of passage or an initiation. Right. And I do, I was looking into the connection between cable toe and a necktie. And I believe there's something there, but I lost my research on it. There's also a connection with the noose and the gallows. Uh, so I think these things, they didn't just come out of nowhere. It's They kind of morphed over time or they took ideas. There's there's connections between these different, these different elements and they have their exoteric meaning. And then there's also some esoteric meaning to them as well. I mean, I'll never look at my lodge outfit when I lay out my clothes to go to lodge and go, okay, well, I'm just, you know, buttoning up my shirt all the way to the top button. I'm flipping up my collar. I'm tying my necktie. I'm putting my collar back down. I'm grabbing my jacket and I'm heading out the door. Like all of these things now to me have a deeper meaning because what I've always been told when I ask, why do we have to wear a dark suit and tie or in certain areas of jurisdiction? And I've been told because this is the uniform of a gentleman and now i understand why that phrase is true after all of these years and generations right and like you could even continue to look further like for example they say the top shoe that you can wear um is a cap toe oxford right so oxford of course ties to england but cap toe i know that it has the line across it but i don't know why it's called a cap toe but it reminds me of the head because could put is head. But then if you look at what's popular right now, the most popular shoe in streetwear is Crocs. And Crocs were actually invented for the movie Idiocracy. <laughs> they were in Idiocracy. So it really shows when you talk about the profane, what do they use? They use profanity. And when you talk about the Templars, they're in the temple. And we are in the temple ourselves, right? Because our body is a temple and we're building the temple. Right. So they're really that's really kind of the other inspiration was that I wanted to see what the elite, the royalty and those classes, what were they doing? And I noticed with masonry, much of our whole pomp and circumstance does kind of relate to parliament and these uh, royal pattern, royal rituals. Right. For lack of a better word. Meanwhile, when you look at what we have here on the lower level, T-shirts, boots, sneakers, right? Athletic shoes, right? Became the fashion. That's really the opposite end of the spectrum. Well, they don't call it the royal art of masonry for nothing. And I believe that you have shed a lot of light on the wardrobe and the clothing and really kind of what builds up to being the decorum of what we need to carry into a lodge. This has been the Craftsman Online Podcast. Wow, great for our first episode. I want to thank uh, Brother Kevin Schamberger for coming on this week. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. I appreciate you inviting me. If you've enjoyed our podcast and you want to hear more, you can tell Siri or Alexa to play the Craftsman Online podcast. We're available on all streaming platforms with new episodes every Monday morning. Until next time, let peace and harmony prevail. Peace.